without any further ado, um, I want to welcome you to the Norwich University inaugural Leadership Conference and Todd Lecture Series keynote address, The Road Less Traveled. We'll th we're thrilled to have Maureen here, Vice President, Chief Information Security Officer of Johnson & Johnson, recently retired, um, here with us this evening. And Ms. Allison is an accomplished executive and leader who has applied her talents in both the military and corporate sectors. She is also a trailblazer, having been part of the first female cohort to graduate from the United States Military Academy at West Point. After graduating from West Point, Ms. Allison served in the U.S. Army, where she held several leadership positions. Her military service taught her many valuable lessons about leadership, teamwork, and resilience that have served her well throughout her career. After leaving the military, but before joining the corporate world, she served as a special agent in the FBI, working on undercover drug operations in Newark, New Jersey, wonderful place to visit, and also working on terrorist bombings in San Diego, California. She developed and participated in the nuclear terrorism exercise Compass Rose in 1988, the largest mock terrorism incident exercised um, by the federal government. Ms. Allison's most recent corporate post has been um, the CISO for Johnson & Johnson with the primary responsibility for protecting their information technology systems and business data worldwide. This includes ensuring that the company's information security posture supports business growth objectives, protects public trust in Johnson & Johnson brand, and meets legal and re regulatory requirements. I met Ms. Allison during the COVID crisis and uh, remarkable job bringing Johnson & Johnson through that era. But prior to uh, joining J&J, uh, Maureen was Chief Security Officer and VP of Medco, the largest pharmacy benefit manager in the U.S. Maureen was responsible for all aspects of the company's security regulatory compliance, including physical and logistic security, executive protection, as well as HIPAA, payment card industry, Medicare, and prescription frauds and IT controls. In short, Ms. Allison is widely recognized as an expert in the field of cybersecurity and risk management. She has been featured in numerous publications, including the Wall Street Journal, Forbes, and Fortune, and has been a guest on several national news programs. As a keynote speaker at today's leadership conference, Marianne Allison will share her insights and experiences on leadership, cybersecurity, and risk management. She will draw upon her experiences in both the military and private sector to provide valuable advice and inspiration to all of us who are striving to become better leaders. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Marion Allison, our TARD Lecture uh, Series keynote speaker. So, so you have to be my timer. You have to be my timer. OK. All right. Hey, everyone. It's wonderful to be here. Um, First of all, it was actually warmer in Burlington when I landed um, at 67 degrees than it was when I left Jacksonville, Florida this morning at 9.30 in the morning. So on you guys for actually having better weather in Vermont, because I was fearful for the entire trip, oh my God, what if they have a snowstorm? Um, and it, it's real, you know. April is a good time for snowstorms in Vermont. Like last week, it was 20 degrees. I was looking at the weather, and I'm like, OK, I don't have those clothes anymore. I have completely uh, transformed. I met General Gaines at Embry-Riddle a couple of years ago. We were both bored out of our tears. What, you know, what the heck are we doing sitting here? And she was down the road a couple hours. So I got my son, and we got in the car, and we drove down there. Now my son, it, um, is, uh, he works at J&J &J also. And he's an IT, works in our supply chain uh, for our contact lenses on um, uh, programming and running the technology that ships those contacts uh, worldwide. Um, but where he wanted to go to school in the beginning was Embry-Riddle. And so we thought it would be a great road trip, especially in the middle of pandemic. We're in Florida. We didn't really know about COVID, okay? Because uh, we had a completely different experience down there than New England did. Uh, went down there, and um, we just, Karen and I hit it off. 
we just started chit-chatting about this thing, that thing, and the other thing. And what it told me is, is even in the middle of a pandemic, you can find new friends. And that's what we did is we became very fast friends. Now, Norwich University. Everybody's told me how wonderful it is today. I want you to know I already know that. I love this school, okay? Um, it is the, one of the most amazing schools in my mind. You know why? I love cyber talent. You are one of the very first universities to have a cyber master's degree program. Information assurance. You're awesome. You also have a core cadets. That's awesome. I could not be any prouder to actually have been asked to come here. The other thing that why I love Norwich and I love Vermont so much it's where I used to summer when I was a little girl. So when I got off of 89 and, and to go into Montpelier and it said St. Johnsbury, it brought back a very warm feeling to my heart. It's where I saw my first stuffed moose. And to this day, I haven't seen a real moose. Okay, there's signs everywhere on the highways here, but I have not seen that real moose. I am sure one day I will. Um, Hopefully I'll be in Vermont. Um, and I used to go up to Willoughby Lake and um, in the Northeast Kingdom and absolutely loved it. So when I was in high school and I was on speech and debate, one of the poets that I most was enthralled with and I loved his poems was Robert Frost. And on my saber when I graduated from West Point, and I gave to my parents that now sits in my office. It says, two roads diverged in the woods, and I took the one less traveled, and it made the it's made all the difference. And I didn't put this slide up. This slide deck was originally created in about 2016, and so I've been using that since then. So the spirit of Vermont has been with me for all these years. So thank you for that. All right, now here's the, will it work? Ah. Plan B. Let's see. So that's me, field hockey. And we were talking today at dinner about field hockey. And um, I played field hockey, it was a state championship team. And being a top level athlete and what you need to give to a team became a very, very important fundamental core value that I had is that it's not about just me. It's not about, well, I was a defender, so I was never gonna score unless I scored on myself, and thank God I never did that. Um, but it was making sure that we were defended. We won our state championship because, little known fact in field hockey, in the defensive zone, if you're at a tied game, it's who's less time in one side of the goal becomes how you win the game. That's how we won the championship. So um, for all my defenders out there, hey, here's Anya. Um, I was class president. I won by two votes. I was in the race, and I won by two votes. It doesn't matter. I won. I was a class president. The other guy left and went to a private school because he was so ashamed of being a woman becoming the class president. Uh, eventually inducted into the Hall of Fame, uh, which was pretty amazing. Every other woman on that, that team uh, actually played on a D1 school for field hockey. Now, the story here 
is the very first school that I really was interested in going to was Wes Wellesley. All-female school just outside of Boston. That was my number one school. When I realized that wasn't going to happen, my number two school was I would go to the Air Force Academy because they just opened. November 1975, they opened up the military academies for admissions for women. And my dad said, hey, Maureen, you could go to the Air Force Academy. So I applied to go to the Air Force Academy. The second, um, what I didn't know, was I also received, well, I knew it, did know it, I received a four-year ROTC scholarship to MIT. What no one ever told me was, I could go to MIT for free, and I would be accepted. No one ever told me that. ROTC people didn't tell me. They just gave me the scholarship, and I did not know what to do with it. There is only one person in my life, or my very first sponsor in my life at that time, was the congresswoman that I applied to go to the Air Force Academy with. She decided she didn't want me to go to the Air Force Academy. She gave me her principal nomination to West Point. So sight unseen, didn't know what the MIT thing was about. You know, you talk about being 17 and not knowing what's going on in life, okay? So I go, can't, I don't know what this MIT thing, I'm not getting into Wellesley. I'm not getting the Air Force Academy. Margaret Heckler gives me this principal nomination on July 7th, 1976, sight unseen, I show up at West Point had never been on the campus, never had talked to any instructor, and I showed up and went to West Point. Kind of crazy. But you can do it. You can do it. I showed up with 119 women, and there were 4,400 men at West Point and 4,399 of them didn't want us there. They did not want us there. We were changing history. There are, hall, there are academic halls at West Point that still have latrines in the women's bathrooms, 45 years later. They took the tails on the full dress coat. There was, uh, there was a woman who had a full dress coat on and the tails with the buttons right, in the back. They decided that the women's butts were a little bigger, so they were going to cut the tails off. They cut the tails off of those full dress jackets that they issued to the women, which told me they never intended us to graduate, because where do the firsties stand in formation? And full dress gray over white, was really gonna look bad with white butts in the back. But that's, they, it, there was no concept that we would make it all the way through. What has been found out over those years, oh, and the other story was, we were allowed to wear skirts in formation. You, you're allowed to wear skirts in formation, right? Here, right, you wear skirts. Um, I was pulled off the mess hall steps by my skirt as a plebe and yelled at that I wasn't allowed to wear the skirt in formation. And because of that, that resolve, I decided at that point in time that I would no longer allow to be people to be told that they couldn't do something that they were allowed to do. And I was going to make it better. And my voice was no longer going to be quiet. Now, I decided that I didn't take any action on that until after I graduated, okay? Because I did want to graduate. It was comp constant competition against men. But I found a sport. Oh, yeah, the field hockey thing. This is what you should know. So the recruiter, somebody did talk to me, and they did say, you know, Maureen, we're going to have field hockey at West Point. So you'll be great here. I'm like, uh, okay. 
43 years later, there's still no field hockey at West Point. Okay, I'm still waiting. So I had to find another sport, but I got the thinking sport. So I became an orienteer. There are a few things that women have to do well in the military uh, to even be seen as successful. You have to be able to run. You have to be able to run, and you have to think while you're running because you've got all sorts of other things that are going to happen that day. But one of the things I found out was I was really good at orienteering, so good at orienteering, not only um, at part of our training, uh, my roommate and I uh, did a marathon together, but we made the U.S. orienteering team and were able to go to St. Gallen, Switzerland. And in 1980, the U.S. boycotted the Olympics. And we're one of very few people who actually got to compete on the international stage um, at this orienteering championship and represent the United States. And it, it was absolutely amazing um, how much fun it was. Now, a couple, two weeks from now, I'm having 25 of my female classmates at my house. I'm setting up an orienteering course. We have a 219-acre farm, and so we plan to uh, have some fun. So after I graduated, I got to go to St. Gallen, Switzerland, and orienteer. Um, then I went to Fort McClellan, Alabama, where I met my husband um, and married 42 years, and we were both military police officers. Now, I had an electrical engineering degree from West Point. You get to choose your branch at West Point by your class rank. Well, choose or chosen, one will have to de debate what those are. So I got voluntold, and at the time, we didn't know, they weren't sure about women in ADA or FA. And there were no women in infantry or armor, none. And so um, I got the very last slot in military police. And because I got that slot, um, uh, I met my husband, who knows, I may have met him otherwise, uh, but I met him there. It was a long, hot summer at Fort McClellan, Alabama, so anybody who's been there knows what I'm talking about. And from there, I went to um, uh, Fort Hood, Texas, and um, I went to aerosol school. At aerosol school, um, uh, after I got through with aerosol school, I found out that I actually was pregnant with my son when I went to aerosol school. And he's always been demanding that he should have aerosol wings because he also went through. Uh, but uh, I tell him, hey, he's a helicopter pilot. I should have helicopter wings. And so we, we end with that. Um, I went to Fort Chaffee, Arkansas, when they brought in the, uh, the Cuban, Cuban Mariolitos that were uh, let out of Castro's prison um, and learned very early um, uh, about civil disruption, uh, civil dis disobedience. Uh, there were riots there while we were there. And learning how to deal with that situation became extremely important. It's also when I started realizing government policy can impact and I can make a difference. How can I make a difference in this world um, by managing some of these situations? So, what did I do? Um, well, actually it was Donald Rumsfeld um, decided that he didn't want women to get shot at. He didn't want women in harm's way. We were in the military, but he didn't want us in harm's way. We were probably, what, three, four percent of the force at that point in time. So I got out of the army, where half the time you didn't have bullets in your gun anyway, and I went to the FBI, and I wore a gun with bullets every single day. And um, part of what I did um, was in San Diego, this, um, I did background checks. Oh, I guess that's uh, not Rumsfeld. That's um, the Supreme Court judge that we, looked, uh, we did his background check. And then we had Captain Rogers bombing. Anybody know what the Captain Rogers bombing was? Any of my history majors? Captain Rogers was the captain of the Vincennes. It was an Argeus cruiser in the Gulf, and he, in 19, 
late 1980s said that an Iranian Airbus, a civilian Airbus, was attacking his ship, and he shot it down. If we had looked at history um, over the years, we would have been looking for terrorists using airplanes as a bomb, as a weapon. And that is part of what we saw later in New York City uh, with the World Trade Center, was the use of those aircraft. Um, and from there, um, my husband and I decided we didn't like it. Hey, California was too cool for us. So we moved to the East Coast, and they put us in Newark, New Jersey. And I did undercover drug operations. Um, and as part of that, being able to talk to people. So everyone always wanted to know, how did you, Maureen, how, how did you get these great drug informants? I tapped in to a group that was bringing in over 10,000 kilos of cocaine into the New York metro region every single month. It was by talking to people and listening to what they have to say and reaching to them at their situation and understanding. Not judging, not criticizing, but talking to them. And what I found out is the more people I talked to, the more people they came to me, and I ended up getting some really great informants. Now, one of the, the coolest things um, that I did was um, we knew that 10,000 kilos of cocaine, no, 1,000 kilos, excuse me, were coming into the port of Houston. And no drug dealer does anything on uh, Monday through Friday. They do it on the weekends because they know all the FBI agents are, and cops aren't working on the weekends. And so um, my informant told me um, that they were coming in Port of Houston. And he was going down there and he was supposed to pick up the load. So I picked up the load and I worked with the Houston FBI who when I flew down there to talk to them on Labor Day weekend thought I was out of my mind and wouldn't hear me wouldn't listen to me, that in fact we have tapped into this network. And they didn't want to do it. It beat up my informant. He had all sorts of bruises and scabs on his back uh, from uh, what they did to him. I convinced the Harris County in Houston to let me take him. And I put him in a tractor trailer and myself and a cooperating witness, and we drove that tractor trailer back across the United States through Atlanta. And in Atlanta, hey, this was before ATMs, so like, guess what? I, somewhere I ran out of money, didn't have gas money. Um, and so the FBI office um, had to meet me um, at some sleazy motel outside of Atlanta with cash so that I could actually buy food and buy gas to drive this tractor trailer back to New Jersey. Um, and I've got like a tunic top on, I got my gun leather underneath, I got my gun underneath my tunic, and we're at a gas station and I'm filling up, because we also had a chase car, the car that I was in um, was a Lincoln Continental with Georgia plates, and the tractor trailer had Florida plates on the, the cab and main plates on the tractor, or on the trailer. We were like, drug deal, drug deal, drug deal, right? I got, we got stopped a lot. Um, and so we drove this su sucker back up and we decided, um, I got into uh, Maryland and we were waiting uh, for the FBI office up in Newark uh, to coordinate the, the takedown activities. Because what we wanted to do was we were going to take this, this load and we were going to pretend to give it to the bad guys so we could get to the next group that would get us in um, into the larger group so we could figure out who was getting the 10,000 kilos. So sitting there in a parking lot in Maryland. Anybody been through Maryland? Right? Maryland State Troopers? Right, like you look sideways, like they're stopping you, right? So the Maryland State, on that super fresh parking lot, 
in uh, Maryland. And State Trooper comes over and he's like, uh, hey, what's going on? And I go, hey, I'm an FBI agent and show him my badge. And I go, you're not gonna really believe me. It's okay, I get this. I've got Lincoln Continental with Georgia Plagues, I've got this, that, and the other thing. I said, I need you to call the Newark FBI office, who they called, who then told them let the real story. He comes back and he goes, I just want you to know, I wish you good luck and you're right, I didn't believe you. And so here we were, this traveling drug deal. And the, the idea of it is again, this informant, he trusted me with his life. His life was in my hands. And to be able to get someone to trust you in that manner, and then to be able to ensure that their safety is taken care of. We did the deal on the New Jersey Turnpike like 10 p.m. that night after I'd been there for 10 hours, 12 hours, um, and we were able to take it down. But two things from this is that trust of that individual, and we were able uh, to get him relocated so he didn't get killed um, afterwards. Um, and I handed him off to another FBI agent who was then in Florida and, and took care of him uh, for a long time. And the other thing is, does this face look like a drug dealer? It is not. So don't take an expectation or say, hey, I can't do that because I don't know it, or I don't look like it, or I'm not tall enough, or I'm not short enough, or I'm not fat enough or I'm not thin enough. What I learned um, <laughs> on the cold New Jersey Turnpike is that um, you just have to do the thing and understand and learn. There's a series of tasks, and just because you don't look like it, and just because it's not convention, you can do whatever you want if you, if you just learn and treat people very, very well. It's a long way back to, you know, but I'll get there. So after I had worked in the FBI, and so you see a pattern here. I went to the United States Military Academy at West Point. It was all men. Didn't listen, still graduated. Then I went in the FBI, still in this convention of what you can do and can't do. Um, I ran in what ended up being my second sponsor. My first one was Margaret Heckler, and my second was Lieutenant General Sam Wetzel. He's a West Point graduate. What I, he was on the board of directors of a and Foods, and he was there with um, two women, um, one of the very first board of directors in the United States that had women on it. One was the... Uh, major stockholder's uh, wife, and the other was her best friend. Well, over wine one night, they were talking about who the, fur, who the new head of security should be. They, um, they were looking for a, um, somebody in law enforcement, somebody who was a woman, and oh yeah, we better find somebody who's a West Point graduate. And it would be great if they lived in New Jersey. One person fit that bill, that was me. When I went in for the interviews, here I am, an FBI agent. I know nothing about corporate security. Zero. Nada. Nothing. And I went in and I was, okay, we'll just see how this works. It was my time, let me go in. It ended up, we talked about leadership. We talked about developing a team. We talked about how to learn in the security area. And so what I did, I, obviously I passed the interview and I became their head of security. And what I learned there was, and this is specifically for a lot of the women, you'll go in thinking, I'm not 100% qualified. 
I was about 10% qualified from my, my perspective. They thought differently. Go in even if you think you're not 100% qualified. And this is for the men too. This is for everyone. Go in and the only way you're not going to get the job it, for sure is if you don't apply. Apply. You'll be surprised. And then we'll get a little further on around cybersecurity, because I'm a geek and I gotta get my cybersecurity stuff in here. Uh, one of the things that you'll see is that sometimes the job descriptions are written um, uh, by security engineers and they don't know any better that they need people that aren't all security engineers. You need diversity. So they write these job descriptions that nobody, so 25 years of cybersecurity experience. And when they bring the job description to me, I'm like, cyber didn't ex exist 25 years ago. What, what are you doing here? Um, and what you find is, is people will overwrite job descriptions. Go in anyway, because you're good. You're going to be able to make it. I worked in, uh, I was the head of security for 10 years there. And I uh, did physical security and investigations. And then, uh, oh, <laughs> one of the things. Uh, there was a group of Albanians. They came from the Russian circus. And they defected, and they came to the United States. And what they were doing is they were breaking into grocery stores and into the safes. Um, and they would crack the safes, um, and then they'd take all the money out, and they'd leave. And the FBI actually thought it was kind of crazy when I told them, hey, we've got hundreds of these. So I organized the Food Marketing Institute. We put together a program with all the other grocery stores, and there was no internet at the time still, so we were faxing these documents in, and we brought them together and brought it to the FBI, who opened up a major case called the Yugoslavians, Albanians, and Croatian, the Yaks. And what they were doing was raising money uh, for the war in Herzegovina. And we were able to follow them everywhere they were on the East Coast. And after we moved them out of the grocery stores, that we actually, they actually moved into like the Home Depots and Lowe's because, hey, if you broke into our store, you got food and money, but if you broke into a Lowe's, you could actually get the sledgehammers and um, heavy equipment that they needed for other jobs. Um, and I, know not, I knew nothing about safes, but I befriended a guy uh, that ran a city safe company in Jersey City. And we sat down and designed a safe that they couldn't break into. And that's how we got them moved off um, out of the A&P food stores and into these other big box locations. I actually ended up doing um, speaking and conversations with law enforcement all over the United States uh, because they had seen this crime group, um, but they didn't quite know what it was. And we started connecting all the pieces together to get the FBI involved. So even one simple citizen can be the conduit to be able to get law enforcement to understand what's going on and make it work. Um, just because it sounds preposterous doesn't mean it is. I got a job because of a sponsor, a second time a sponsor in my life. Sponsors are incredible, powerful people. They will see things that you don't see. The first thing I will tell you with sponsors is even if what they say sounds crazy, listen to them. They know better and, and do it. The worst thing you can do with a sponsor is they give you the greatest advice ever or provide you with here is a job on a silver platter for you and you go, yeah, no, I don't want that. There's a reason why they want you to do it and you should look at that because not only will you make friends for life, but you'll also propel your career. Leaving the FBI was one of the harder, th leaving the Army was the hardest thing I had to do. But leaving the FBI, I was like, okay, I really like this thing and I'm good at it. But that's what got me into corporate America. And that's one of those roads that I took, even though it sounded a little crazy at the time. Avaya, okay, now the internet is barely 
We're talking 2002. Um, Internet's out there, not a big deal yet. Um, the biggest virus out there is like love bug, right? Nothing major, all address, you know, go in, steal your contacts, send out crazy little emails to everybody with a little spam in them, and then steal more. Um, uh, nothing big. I started there in February 2002, um, and um, Six weeks later, the head of IT security for Avaya decided to go back and work at Lucent. Avaya had just split from Lucent, and he said, eh, I'm going back to Lucent. So off he went. My boss came into my office and said, hey, Maureen, how'd you like to be the head of IT security? Me? Yes! Sign me up now! That's the job I want. Because I knew when I was over at A&P, <clears throat> that I had to learn this thing called IT, this internet, this technology was coming out. It needed me. I'm an electrical engineer. I should be doing this. And so I said, yeah. What I didn't know that I just signed up for <clears throat> was Avaya was going to be um, a sponsor of the World Cup in Korea and Japan in 2002. If somebody could get me water, I would love you forever. Thank you. <coughs> um, and so, um, voice over IP. Does everybody know? That's what runs your phone. In 2002, it was not in production. 2002 was not in production. First time ever on a world stage, Avaya decided to showcase their voice over IP in Korea and Japan. And I had just signed up to run the Security Operations Center, not a term that was wi wildly used at the time, um, for the entire World Cup network. And I would tell you that I had the best master's degree education in network security from a guy by the name of Greg Sautin, who was, uh, had been had been Russian, he's now American citizen, uh, of Russian descent, who sat down and told me everything he knew. And I learned it, and we created the plan. And what I learned was this. I don't always have to know everything about everything. I'm a West Pointer, we like to do that, but that's not the best thing. Trust the people who work for you. Understand what they know, and listen to them empower them. Uh, Greg and I uh, created the plan uh, and implemented it. And from my position as a director of security at Avaya, the more important thing was the relationships. It was my FBI experience, knowing uh, how to get in touch with the FBI in, in uh, Seoul, Korea, because the South Koreans were hard knocking. Um, they were scanning my network so hard, they were starting to turn it over because they wanted to know what the technology was. Can you imagine? We put this like IP, intellectual property for internet protocol, on a live stage in Asia. First go around. Um, and we got knocked all over the place. The only ones who didn't knock, which is surprising now these days, were the Chinese. In 2002, they were not knocking. Um, and looking at that technology. Um, the South Koreans were. And what I used um, in a discussion with, now, I'm a woman, so I took the marketing director, who was a man, and I would talk to him, and then he would talk to the translator, who then would talk to the South Korean law enforcement, who then would all take it back, and that's how the conversation went. And what we did out there is I convinced them that if they continued to scan the network and it would cause to fail on this grand stage in South Korea, it would bring bad faith. They're, they would be seen as failures and that we needed them to not attack the network like that, to not scan it, not attack, but not to scan it, do not scan it to bring it down. And that's how we stayed up. That's exactly how we stayed up. The other thing that we learned um, then was the switches in the network were made by Lucent. 
um, our sister company. And a individual of Polish descent who took an Avaya course in Poland, the same time that the World Cup was coming, had found a fatal flaw and a backdoor vulnerability in our network. So we're very concerned that we're going to have an insider threat of epic proportions at the final, right? A little bit uh, worrisome. So diplomacy works well. We gave that individual four free tickets to the final of the World Cup, all expense paid, in Japan. Because if he was sitting in the stadium, he wasn't going to be hacking. And that's how we were able uh, to keep the network out. The biggest vulnerability to that network ended up being we had one, um, one system failure. In Japan, the culture is that they're very trustworthy. If there's a sign that says, do not enter, people do not enter. So trying to get the LAN closet locked where the servers were was a little difficult. The only outage occurred when the cleaning lady went into the LAN closet to vacuum. She unplugged our server to plug in her vacuum. That was my outage. And so I learned this is not every insider threat is really intentional. Most of them uh, will end up being something, look at what you see, and you're going to see a pattern that might say the intent is not there. It is just collateral damage. And that becomes very important for my cyber warriors because everybody thinks it's somebody from somewhere else that's hacking us. From there, um, so I got back, and um, they moved me to the law department. And as much as I love lawyers, okay, the lawyers and I didn't see each other, and Medco made me an offer uh, to go up and work at Medco as their chief security officer. So I left and went up to Medco. And now we're talking in New Jersey, we're all talking, you know, um, uh, just on 278, right? You know, like I moved from one company to another. It's great. New Jersey was like this. My son could stay in school. It all worked out. Um, what I learned over at Medco, Medco was a pharmacy benefit company. What's that? Most of you don't have prescriptions. Well, at least uh, after the first four rows, okay? <laughs> Most of you don't have prescriptions, okay? So in the healthcare system, um, uh, when you get a prescription, whether you get a CVS or Walgreens or wherever, um, there is a system underneath that checks that you didn't get one at four doctors and, and you're doing something you shouldn't be doing. Your benefit company, um, your insurance company, actually uses these exchanges. Medco had the prescription history of 65 million Americans um, in their database. That's what we were protecting. Um, but out of that, what was coming is privacy rules, security rules, uh, Sarbanes-Oxley around the financials, all were coming out. And so all of this regulation was coming out, at, out all at once. It did a lot of good, especially in healthcare, because it got us to a bare floor. Now we're going to move that on with some other work that we're doing um, with the government right now uh, on moving those regulations further on. But it got us there. But I learned about IT controls. The other thing I learned is sitting there in March 2010, the Chinese hard knocked every single healthcare company in the United States, every single one. And there were only two types of companies, those who knew it happened and those who didn't, but it happened. And we were one of the ones, and what I realized was the federal government wasn't helping me at all, and the local and state were the only ones that had cyber defenses that were actually interested in talking to us. And so uh, it became, okay, what are we gonna do here? Because the government, there was no CISA Homeland Security looking at these things at that point in time. All right, Johnson & Johnson. This is, this is the fun stuff. So um, 
uh, 12 years ago, over 12 years ago, I went to Johnson & Johnson, okay? Remember, you know, I, I really liked the big jobs. I was CISO, chief security officer at Medco, and I got a call from a recruiter, are you interested in going um, to Johnson & Johnson? It's for the head of IT security, chief information security, it's only IT, really? Um, and, and then I, like, it, and the reason why I said yes, and this is, has to do with work-life balance and family, is that it was two-hour commute up to Avaya, or uh, up to Medco, and I had had a, um, uh, an apartment that I stayed at during the week. But I spent a lot of time away from my husband. And um, he had been down in D.C. for a long period of time working on the World Trade Center uh, 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 investigation that was uh, presented to Congress. But we were now like, okay, what are we doing here? So I'm driving past. I'm an hour into my commute. I look over to the right. It's the J&J building that I'd be working at. And after the light, it, it, as the light turned red and I'm sitting there, I hit the phone to call the recruiter and say, yes, I'm interested. Because now I'd be to work after an hour instead of two hours. Um, and I said, okay. And then I kept, like, it's like a smaller job. It's only IT security, right? Because it was before IT security was a really big thing. Um, this is where I ran into what I'll call my third mentor. Laverne Council, she's a black female CIO. And she saw my resume, she saw that I was a West Point graduate, and she wanted me to come to interview. And um, I said, sure. What I found out during the interview was Laverne Council was supposed to be in the class of 1980 at the US Air Force Academy where I wanted to go. She turned it down. She went to another school. But she was so intrigued with, law, with the military and what it represented, she wanted the brand in her IT organization. And so I joined. I liked her. I liked the interview panel. I liked what I was going to do there. I liked the team I was going to work with. So I, I said yes. I started out in that organization. We had 28 FTE in the entire global IT security network of J&J. &J. We went to 26. I was going nowhere fast. I presented my IT. I worked with a consultant, Deloitte, Techno uh, Deloitte and uh, we created the strategy and presented it. When I left in January, I had 390 full-time equivalent employees and 300 contractors worldwide. I got the best MBA that I didn't pay for in my entire life, learning how to run an organization of that scale and magnitude. Um, over $128 million per year of technologies that we were running. And it was because, again, it goes back to listen to the people that you have, understand what's going on. I was ready to retire in February 2020. Went in, performance appraisal time, told my boss, hey, you know, I'm at that tender little age. Um, I think in September, by September, I want to retire. On April, first start of April of 2020, I called them, because we were all out. We were all out of what we were doing then. And I said, Jim, we're making a vaccine. I can't leave now, and I'll stay till we get to the other side of this. J&J &J decided to make a vaccine, a typical drug in its production at any company is over 10 years. It takes 10 years to produce a drug in the United States from the very first genome all the way through to an approved FDA drug. We did it in 14 to 16 months. 
things were moving. One of the things that came, and there are many, many other companies out there trying to do the same. Lilly, Merck, Pfizer, Moderna, AstraZeneca. They were all doing the same thing. Most of them fell to the side. And the one thing, and I really wanted to retire. I was really ready to retire. But it became very clear, I'm about mission. When I raised my hand on that plane at West Point, and I said I would defend against all enemies, foreign and domestic, I meant it. And even though, at, at 17 years old, I could never conceive that I would learn a new technology and then be the best at defending it, defending in cyberspace, I could have never conceived that at 17. But somewhere along the way, all those things I had learned, all those opportunities, all those doors that were opened, put me on this stage, and there's very few times in your life you'll feel this, and you're like, I'm right here at the right time doing the right thing, and this is going to be good for the world. And that's what we did. J&J created that vaccine. And you, you can work at J&J for 100 years, and you still will never know the process of how a drug is. We learned it um, in security because we had to stay one step ahead of all the clinical. And the truth be known, the reason why um, I went down to visit General Gaines is because they had a CRISPR. And because they had that CRISPR, and it was in the book about Jane Jay's board member and all the work that they had done on genome therapy, I wanted to go talk to somebody who had one and what they were doing with it. It was a self-discovery. Um, but so Jane Jay starts making this vaccine. I get calls from governments around the world asking me, hey, our, we don't think our systems are as, our cyber defenses are as good as J&J's. Will you let us know if you hear something? My, sat, my very first call was to Chris Krebs, who's the director of uh, CISA and Homeland Security. Chris, we got a problem. And out of that, he helped launch um, Operation Warp Speed. And I got to, they put a general in charge, um, and uh, the general knew nothing about IT security, but knew a heck of a lot about physical security. And so um, I, I helped um, educate him enough and tell him and help him get with the right agencies. I need you to get the FDA in the background. I need you to get NSA. I'm going to need some help here. And um, every week I got to talk to the good general, and we discussed those things. During that time, in 20, um, we had a 30% increase in ransomware. In 21, we had a 30% increase in ransomware. In 22, we had a 30% increase in ransomware. Additionally, the day that we submitted our patent for our vaccine is the same day Putin came out and said, oh, we already have a vaccine, and put it in his daughter's arm, June 21. Well, we were doing a whole lot of looking for insider threat at that point in time. Because how the hell could he know that the day we submitted? Well, he might have learned something um, uh, out of the government, but he didn't learn it from us. We checked all our systems. We had the right technologies in place to know where that vaccine strain, string was and whatever. What we did find out, little known fact, is we had, um, we had an individual who had to go through, and, and it, this wasn't a leak, right? This is just one of those, when you think it's an insider threat and it's not really an insider threat, <clears throat> it's probably something else, ah, the water. Uh, what we found out was um, the, 
the um, regulatory department needed to print out all 600 pages. They have to review all 600 pages of the submission to make sure there's no spelling errors, everything's right, everything's accurate, all the data is correct. We're talking about data accuracy. Um, and the individual, what you didn't realize is we had opened up the ability to print in their house. So she sent it to her Google Drive so she could print it. But we could trace it and find out, and then we contacted her. But we're all sitting there like, oh my god, do we have an insider? And oh yeah, better yet, she was of Russian descent. It was perfect. It was like a perfect storm. She was going to go to jail. We, we had her dead to rights. And I, I don't know, a little thing went off in my head. And I said to the attorney, I said, Bill, I need you to call this woman. I call her, she's going to think she's in trouble. She might be in trouble, but you're a lawyer. And ask her why she printed to, the, to Google. Well, come to find out, she didn't know that she could print just normally on her home printer by just clicking print. And so she sent it to the Google because there's no way she was going to read 600 pages online. Crisis averted. The data, because you know what? No Russian spy sending it to Google Drive because it just didn't make sense. Right? We were talking about forensics earlier, right? You know, like these facts aren't, aren't adding up. You know, nobody's sending that to your Google Drive. Not, not if you're trying to hide it, because I got that. Um, so anyway, we talked to her, explained what she could do. She was very happy, um, uh, and we were very happy that we didn't have an insider. But we had Putin. So it seemed like every time we were getting someplace, and we used outside manufacturing of that vaccine, and every, when we were doing the assessments, what we found was there were parts of the, uh, some of the companies weren't ready for a cyber attack of the magnitude we were seeing. And by the time we got to the fourth one, um, and this was with the government of South Africa, they redesigned the entire plant to make sure it was sustainable. And they were the only ones who didn't suffer attack. Um, the other was um, as, as much luck as we had had with the FDA submitting our submissions, we had to submit worldwide. Well, the, the Europeans who have GDPR, which is this grandiose uh, privacy law that's supposed to protect everybody's privacy, well, the European medical agency had no cybersecurity, so they lost not only um, our, our first mission, it, was, it wasn't uh, detrimental to us, but our first mission, but Pfizer's and Moderna's all at the same time. And so, again, it's that influence in those areas in what you can do. So I'm about at my wit's end. Um, and uh, the uh, vaccine uh, is January of 2022, I think, at that point. Um, and our vaccine is about to roll. We get a de denial of service attack, which means it's just somebody smacking against your network so hard. 17 times our network strength. And only because I had read a piece of intel uh, a couple months prior that said DDoS attacks were starting to pick up in, um, uh, in healthcare, uh, did we start, we made the sure, I pushed that that technology went to the forefront. We had installed um, the devices two weeks prior to the attack. Just in time, security delivery is good as gold. Okay, two weeks too late, it had been another story. Um, but we were able to sustain. In January, when the first trucks rolled out of our Kentucky distribution center, they created a video. There was not a dry eye in the entire corporation when they watched that because of so much that had gone into it. Um, and um, that was, and then the vaccine rolled out, and then, and I'm like, okay, time to retire here, time to retire, and um, uh, we, we're getting towards the end of the year, and it looks like Russia is going to invade the Ukraine. And so at that point in time, um, uh, in the position that I had, we had created we had been watching the Russians and the Ukrainians for at least five years prior. Not Petya uh, was out of that region. 
It was the Ukraine, by the way. It was MeDocs. It was attack software that um, was an upload that the Russians had uh, corrupted the server. Uh, and that caused not Petya for those companies that completely failed. And out of that, um, uh, I, had, I had told my team, how long, how long, people, does it take to bring, to take the network down between us and the Ukraine? Well, Maureen, it takes a couple weeks, and we've got to send people here, and we've got to send people there. And I go, you got five seconds. I want five seconds for gold. My head of uh, security engineering and architecture, um, Niall Casey, he's a good friend of mine. Uh, he's in New Zealand. Um, he, um, he goes, Marina, that's not possible. And I go, it's only impossible for others. For you, you'll get it done. And so they started working on it in 2016. And um, they were able to get it where they could take it down immediately. But they couldn't bring it back up. I said, no, down's good. You gotta bring it back up, because once we need it. Just prior to the Russians invading the Ukraine, uh, we got a technology called Zscaler, which gave us that capability. So five seconds up, five seconds down. We can do it. And even though they thought they couldn't do it, once you give a team, you can say, okay, I understand, you can't do it. What's it gonna take to do it? and you give them all the capabilities to get stuff done, they will get stuff done. Now, some of it may be reliant on technologies that aren't available, but they'll push on the vendors to get the technologies they need. Because this whole living in this world, leadership in this space, and especially in cyber, it's about working together in the ecosystem. We all bring something different to the table that we all need to defend, to defend our networks, to defend our country, to defend our companies. All right, I have a bunch of slides that talk about the internet and let's see, let me see where we are. We're an hour in, aren't we? Yeah, you know, about 15. Yeah. Okay, all right, so what I'll do is, is um, I've moved through all that. So you're non-geeks, you don't have to worry, okay? But what do the slides say, okay? Um, in today's world, we talk a lot about going digital. What the heck does that mean, right? Let's go digital, let's go to the cloud, let's do this, let's do that, what does that mean? Well, let me talk to you about data and, and computing of data. So back in the olden days, okay, when I was a young pup, just about your age, um, we had mainframes. There's still mainframes that are out there. They still exist. But mainframes was the main way we computed. All the data was here. And the only way you could get to it was through something called RACF, and it gave you entitlements to look at data. You could see everything that was touched. You knew who looked at the data. And how you looked at it were these things called green bar reports. And the older folks in the audience all sort of laugh, right? So this morning, when I was, or this afternoon, when I was picking up my car at Avis, they have a pin dot printer. Pin dot printers were used for these green bar reports, right? So Avis can tell me all they want, that look at our new website, they're running on crap because you don't have pin dot printers that work if you, unless you have really old applications underneath. So what happened, okay, so I told you about these mainframes. And then in the late 1990s, everybody thought it would be cool and we would go to this thing called the PC. And it was client server. And apps would be developed and then apps were put on there. Um, and it was all client server. So in, in the 80s, when I had to do, like I only took a file folder home to utilize and read at night. Now I could take a laptop home, which was like six file cabinets worth of data. Okay, this really from a security perspective wasn't cool, but that's what we did. And then from client server, um, what happened is we started doing things like, I'll put all my data in somebody else's place and then I'll try to connect to it. 
Okay, HR firms did a lot of that, right? Uh, uh, CA and um, some of the um, uh, HR uh, databases, uh, they were all run that way. It wasn't the cloud yet. It was just, I'll take my data and put it over in your location and at, at client server over there. Then the cloud came out. Um, with the cloud, it was, oh, wait a minute. We can put it all out there. Well, when people said, oh, yeah, we'll put it all out there, there's two things they, they forgot about. One is the network to get there and get back. And the second one was security. Okay, so when they built the original cloud, it was so you just stick your crap out here and you don't have to worry about security anymore. It'll be cheaper. It was and you got hacked. Um, it was just, it was really simple. Um, then what you have and what you see a lot today is you have companies that have a little bit of mainframe and they have a little bit of client server and they have a little bit of cloud. That is not a digital environment. Even if you have a website on top of it, it is not digital. Then you'll see companies like Uber or Lyft who, you see a little car, it can follow you where you're at, you can pay online, it connects, it, it does all these things. That's digital. And what is it gonna take to get there? It's gonna take all that crap, all those mainframes and all of that data, you're going to have to figure out what you're gonna do with it to get it so it can be used in a digital manner or a cloud manner or everything everywhere. The network has changed over time. As I told you, I have my story of voice over IP and what I did, um, and that was, that was a turning point. Voice over IP is what powers your cell phone, your computers, all the things you see around you is because of that technology. And then as we move into uh, 5G, I mean real 5G, not 10G like what, is it Verizon who has that? So, oh, I have 10, 10G, I'm like, no you don't, that's not even a thing. Um, and, and we move into everything everywhere, commuting, communicating with everything, it changes all the security profile. Why is that important to all of you? You are the talent. You in this university are creating the people that will solve the security problems and issues and opportunities, because it's not always a problem, because for every bad thing that comes out, 10 good things come out of it. Each and every one of you, if you remember correctly, I told you I was an electrical engineer. I was an electrical engineer because I didn't have computer science then, because I didn't have computers then, all right? And I figured it out. And every single one of you is going to be able to figure it out. And even the person who says to me, oh, well, I know nothing about computers. Well, neither did I. You can learn. You can learn and understand and make it happen. And that's why it's about you. Your capacity for learning. And now some of you have spent one year, two years, three years, four years. Hopefully we don't have any five years here, but maybe we do, but you have spent all those years learning. What you need to know for the future hasn't even been created yet. So the learning from Norwich is that you've learned how to learn. You've learned how to be leaders. To learn when even when, oh crap, I don't know, we're going to create a vaccine, what am I going to do here? They have cre created, instilled in each one of you that ability, that strength of character to be able to say, I got this. I got this country. You're, you're in my hands. I can lead. And some of you will choose to do that in uniform. I applaud you. I did my five years in uniform, and my own, one of the, the few regrets one of the very few regrets, is I wasn't able to serve longer. That I wasn't, be able, wasn't able to become a three or a four star general. Because I would have loved that. That, it, that would have been me inside. I had to do other things and I had to be a, uh, a champion, a general on the battlefield called cyber when there were no other P 
people who understood what the battlefield consisted of. But you will, because you have the makings and the learnings that started at this school, and you're going to take them with you. So we, this is where I come in and I talk to you. What are you going to do? You do? These are all the things, all the networks I have. Um, I think at dinner, I think I, I expanded my network like five out, right? Like, yeah, you can be part of that network. You want to do that? Network. Join groups. Um, whether if you go into a critical, if you go into the military, um, there's all sorts of groups um, in that space. Join, how many people are on LinkedIn? All of you, raise your hand. You should all be on LinkedIn. Tonight, Maureen Allison, LinkedIn. Link in with me. My group is your group. My tribe is your tribe. That's what you need to do. Be bold. Know people. All the groups. When I joined a and I was a FBI, gunslinging FBI agent. Okay? Could shoot a possible. It was pretty darn good. Could run really fast. I didn't know anything about retail shrink. I sat in a meeting the very first day at a and Food for eight hours, and it took me to the ninth hour to figure out what retail shrink is. Um, and, but you know what? I learned, and then I realized it's just math. And if I use the scan reports, I can find out what the shrink is. And if I can find out what the shrink is on certain products, on certain cashier lines, I'm going to be able to find out who's trying to, who's doing the wrong thing. Because they all should be average. Well, maybe except for the express line. But then you could see that. And once you get that data, then you, can, you have the power to do something with it. So network. Now we're getting to the end. Nothing is to be feared. It is only to be understood. We must understand more so that we may fear less. This was the inscription on my high school yearbook. This is the quote I put in there. And it has been so true. When I wanted to go to Wellesley, and then I would settle on the Air Force Academy, but I went to West Point, I made lemons, I made lemonade out of the lemons that I was provided. You have been provided one of the best educations that you'll get ever in the United States here at Norwich. Because it's not only about your academic education, it's also about your physical and your leadership and your spiritual education. All of those things will make the whole person. Cybersecurity, internet didn't exist. If that didn't exist, what are you going to learn? What is out there before you? Can you only imagine? We all kind of, you know, the space force, right? But think about it. What could it be? Do I have anybody who went space force? Ah, there he is. He's up in the corner. Raise that hand. Be proud of that. You get the most awesome uniforms ever. You're not going to be in pink and tans. You're going to be in Star Wars heaven. <laughs> You'll be good. You'll be cool. But can you imagine? He's going to learn about satellites. He's going to learn all about these satellites and um, rockets and all of this amazing technology and where it's going to go and how do we defend ourselves in that space. This is what I ask each one of you. You don't have to be the person with the highest GPA, but you can learn something new every single day. Every single day, figure out something new to just ponder on. And it's not just cat nymphs, okay? It can be other things. But to some of those, don't you like wonder how the heck did they get the cat to do that? Um, be authentic. Be you and don't be apologetic about it. If you're Space Force, be Space Force. Be proud. Okay? If you're a Ranger, be a Ranger. 
it's okay. All of those things. You know, we all, you know, you all wear a uniform, uh, we all want to look alike. But every single one of you brings something diverse and different to this auditorium. And that is what you should be proud of. And you should own it. And when you leave here, oh, you're one of those cadets at Norwich. Yeah, I'm pretty darn proud of that. But people will always try to put you in a box. Don't live in anybody's box but your own. Be in the box you want to be and don't care what they're going to say to you. Get a mentor, be a mentor. Or get a sponsor and be a sponsor. Those are very important things. I'm president of West Point Women. It represents the 7,000 West Point women who have graduated, God bless you, um, in 43 years. 7,000, that's it. It represents every single one of them. We help each other every single day. Every single day, we're helping to pull somebody out. It's so easy to like scoff, but how about be the helping hand? Be the person that others want to be. Um, so we were talking about women in the military, and then after the military, I became an FBI agent, and that really didn't help my demeanor much. But when I joined corporate America, I took a, a five by seven card, and on it, I wrote, be kind, be -E, kind, not be -E, kind. Um, and I still have that card, it's on my desk out in my farm in Pinetta. Because we all need a reminder, because sometimes it's just easy to not be kind. But being kind makes you a better human being and makes people want to listen to you and makes people trust you. Um, and that is what is very important. And when I hear, I hear from some of the um, people, some of the, the young men that I used to coach on my son's soccer team, uh, one of them had a birthday yesterday. He's a major up at West Point teaching German. And when I go up to West Point later in May, um, he's going to be there. Um, and, and to see the kindness that we were at, you know, at he as when I coached him um, in soccer, and to now where he is, and he's up at West Point, even though he's not a West Point grad, he's giving back. And that is the type of kindness that we need to have and mentor. I also skip one. North Star. No, where the heck you're going? Okay? You don't have to have it all mapped out. I love it when people come to me and they, they want advice and they ask this question. Mrs. Allison, I'm going to do this and this and this. And by the time I'm 30, and then I'm like, uh, do you have a family in there? Do you have a life in there? Are you just going to do your career? Oh, no. I want to be you one day, and this is how I'm going to do it. Well, what I tell people is, is you know, the North Star is not a direct path. <coughs> Much of it is weaving in and out and being agile in your life and taking the, lemonade, the lemons and making them into lemonade. And good things are going to happen, or bad things will be happening. But you have to look at it and say, OK, now what do I do with this? Someone once asked me, Maureen, is there any mistakes you made in your career? No, there's no mistakes in, in my career. It's the career that I had, and I'm proud of it. Now, maybe I should have become the veterinarian I wanted to be when I was 16, um, but I didn't go that route. I took another route. And so I don't have regrets that I'm not a veterinarian. I've got two horses, for God's sake. You can be sure I'm not upset that I'm not a veterinarian. Um, I like animals, but it doesn't mean I have to be that vet. And those are the things. Find out what you like. I didn't even know. Right here, I took electrical engineering, right? Graduated, became an MP, military police officer, undercover drug officer. And it wasn't until I was at A&P and we were starting to look at all our data that we had, and I'm like, Oh, I kind of like this IT stuff. Like, I really like this IT stuff. 
And so it doesn't, you don't have to know right now what you're going to be. Just know you're going to go in a direction and keep going in that direction. Um, you, you'll find it's a lot more fun that way. I mean, uh, and the thing that I would tell people is you're not going to know everything. But you can read about it and you can apply it. The best education you got at Norwich is not calculus. It is going to be the fact that you know how to read and apply and that you know how to do research and you can look things up and you can go, God, I don't know anything about this, but I'm going to learn. Many times, I am not a drug dealer, but I can figure out how to take one down. And that is what you can do by just reading and applying. Don't get in a comfortable place for too long. You can go there for a while, all right? Christopher Columbus did not find the New World. Well, I'm not sure he even found it, but he, others found it before him, but he gets credit for it. By staying in Spain. You got to move. You got to see things. And if you get into a place where you're comfortable, and you're so comfortable that you're not learning, it's time to learn something new. I am one of the finest CISOs in the world. And I have no problem stating that from what I've gone through in the last 12 years, and then years before that, and years before that. I needed to learn. So what did I do? Well, I failed at retirement. Let me tell you that. I have failed at retirement. But you know what I didn't get to do? I didn't get to spend any time with venture capital and figuring out how we get innovative technologies um, in cybersecurity out of the venture capital world. So I joined a ton of firms. Okay? I don't think any of them is going to make me five, five nickels. I'm not going to make any money out of them. But you know what I learned? Crap. When the SVB, when the Silicon Valley Bank had its issue, almost every one of them that I was working with was concerned with how they were going to make payroll. And if they hadn't made payroll, they could have been out of business. And that whole tier of technology could have just been washed away. A whole tier. So now my recommendation to Jen Easterly, the director of CISA, is that we need to look at the resiliency and viability of the funding of venture capital for cybersecurity. But I wouldn't have been able to make that recommendation if I didn't just go out and play in VC world. And so sometimes it's OK. Just go out and play, because you're going to learn something new. Now I'm into PE, private equity. How does that make that work? And where do they get their money? And what are these funds? And who's putting money in these funds? Um, and even though I know, I'm not a finance person, I know nothing about it, I'm going to learn. Because that's how I can figure out our industry and make it better. And work with uh, government agencies to make recommendations on what do we need in this space. Hey, we don't have labs like we used to. Who's making all the new technology? VCs? And if that is how it happens, then we need to make sure we have the resiliency. This is my family. That's my son. Karen has met my son. That's my daughter-in-law. That's my grandson, the greatest joy of my life, Quinn, and my husband of 43 years. Right there. Your family is your greatest gift. It, it will be your greatest gift. And you always must remember them and bring them along on the journey. You, don't, you will not do this alone. Life is incredibly difficult if you try to do it all by yourself. You'll be the person making the catnaps, I can guarantee. Um, but that is my family. Um, my son is a, is a chip off the old block. Uh, he works at J&J &J also, I told you, in the IT department. Um, and um, he is um, a helicopter pilot turned fixed wing, um, uh, the head of the uh, aviation reserve unit happens to be my West Point classmate and, 
and he calls her Auntie Anne. So um, that is his network uh, that he's used. My daughter-in-law is a physician assistant in cardiology. Um, my grandson's mission, he's older than there, he's seven now, is uh, to outrace myself. Um, and to find his fishing pole that he lost on the St. John's River last weekend. And then my husband, um, who was one of the people I am most proudest of. Um, he it was the chief bomb technician in Newark, New Jersey in the FBI for World Trade Center One. And he had the bead on at least two of the terrorists for World Trade Center Two. Um, and um, he had fallen off the roof. Uh, he wouldn't wait for me to hold the ladder. And um, a week before 9-11, he fell off the roof and had major surgery. So he couldn't be a first responder. Um, and I think pretty much saved his life. Um, do not go where the path may lead. Go instead where there is no path and leave a trail. Any questions? A few questions? Don't be shy. Yeah, we go. All right. I'll take any questions. Come on. We'd like to hear from the students. So we have one coming down here. The mic, we like to do it that way. So oh, okay. you take a swig of water there, my friend. And we have some coming down. Please just give me a moment. I gotta formulate this question for you. Oh, it's okay. Anybody else? Come on down. Come on. Come on, just ton of questions. We get the first one out. Go ahead. Awesome. Thank you, ma'am, for being here. I appreciate it. Uh, it was a really great um, experience to, to hear your journey. A question I have for you is, um, not everyone's perfect. A lot of people make mistakes. How have you been able to bounce back through mistakes and overcome adversity throughout your career? So as I told you, I had no mistakes, OK? They were all learning opportunities, OK? Um, you know, it, it's how you look at something, right? If you look at something like, oh, darn, Right? I didn't get Signal Corps. You know, my life is ruined. I didn't get Signal Corps. Okay, I'll go in peace. Um, it, it, it's really your mental attitude your, of, of how you take it. I'm like, oh, in peace. That's really cool. That's a branch where women can serve just about everywhere men can, because in the day they couldn't serve everywhere. I was like, I can do that. Yeah, that'll be cool. I'll learn that. I kind of like law enforcement. That'll be, you know, you have to be inquisitive about stuff. Um, you know, sometimes we lock ourselves into, if I don't get this house, if I don't get this car, if I don't get this, you know, whatever it is, it's, it's devastating into the world. No, it's not. It might be the best opportunity. Hey, my best opportunity, is I went to West Point. The only place it might have been better was Norwich, okay? But I didn't even know about it, because nobody told me, right? And that's what I'm saying is, is that you have to be open to what, what happens and then the wonder of it. Right? You know, have you ever gotten lost and gone, wow, I didn't know this was out here. This is cool, right? If you hadn't gotten, if you hadn't made a mistake, you wouldn't have gotten there. It's harder these days with Google Maps, but you can occasionally get lost. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. We have a question on the other side. Ah. Hello, ma'am. I'm Dennis Kuntz. I was just, um. Where are you from? I'm from West Texas. West Texas. How did you get to Norwich? <laughs> the school paid me. Ah, there you go. There you go. Sounds good. <laughs> so when it comes down to your personal leadership philosophy, what are the, I guess, three first striking things that should define a leader and how a leader should act, especially around their subordinates? Be kind. Be kind. Yeah, that is probably the very first one. Be compassionate. Okay, and I guess kind and compassionate, you could probably roll them in into the other, right? Listen to what they have to say, okay? Be open to what they're saying to you, okay? And when the world was gonna come to an end because of COVID, 
the thing that I found out was it would have been easy for me to curl up in a ball and have a good cry, but I had to be strong. I had to be strong mentally to be able to talk through it, even when in my heart I didn't feel strong. I had as, um, enough doubts about what was going to happen. So that's what I would say is be kind, be compassionate, and be strong. Hi. Are you from West Texas, too? No, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> Evening, ma'am. My name is Cadet Duntran. I'm from Nam. Ah, there you go. A really long, really long way. You, you got to take two, three, two, three different flights. It's almost like coming from Florida to here. <laughs> <laughs> Same difference. Same, Same difference. difference. Um, I, I took a class last, yeah, I took a class last year. We were talking about military history, and one of the topics that popped up, she was play, blasting Sabaton, uh, the Night Witches, the song, over the loudspeaker when she was, when the teacher was teaching us this, but she was talking about the, the Night Witches and how that how one officer in the Russian, the, the Soviet Union back during, the, during World War II came up with the idea that she's going to put together the, to put together a unit of bombers, of just women. And she has to put, the, or to do the training organization, figure out logistics, figure out what kind of planes they're going to be be flying, what kind of missions they're going to be conducting from scratch. Because, well, if she's not going to do it, nobody will. And she blazed the trail. And I looked at that story and I thought to myself, you know what, I want, maybe one day I want to do something like that. But the question is, chaos. When you deal, when you blaze a trail, you you walk through a patch of grass, you see tall grasses about that, this tall everywhere. How do you know where to go? How do you know what to step on, what not to? How do you navigate through the chaos of vines and trees and bushes and leaves and maybe animals, maybe a stick somewhere that pokes up? Watch out for the snake, too. Don't forget the snake. There's a lot of those in my country. <laughs> I got a, they I'm taste like chicken. It's like Florida. We got a lot of them down there, too. They do taste like chicken. Yeah. But not so, chicken. The chicken tastes like fish. So out of chaos, and, and one of the things is, is it's relying on some of your instinct and your intuition. Okay? Remember I told you about the North Star and I talked about mission and the integrity you have and the knowledge you have. Leaders make the best decision at the moment. People can come, historians can come years later and tell you whether that was a good decision or a bad decision. They're really good at that from their, you know, their desks, um, you know, typing up the, the book, whether you were good or bad. But the reality is you can only make the best decision for what you have in, in front of you. And you will have the knowledge and expertise. You just have to listen to it. Most of the bad decisions or decisions that are second-guessed later are because we don't listen to the what's around us, what our people are telling us. We are not looking at our North Star, and we're not coming at it from the mission. And once you get those clear guideposts in your life, you know which way to go. At West Point, there's a cadet prayer, and there's something called, and, and um, most everybody I know who's memorized this, which is every cadet West Pointer I know, is there's something called the harder right instead of the easier wrong. And even though there's just a phrase in a prayer, there's been a million times in my life and that I've gone, is this the harder right or the easier wrong? And because I had that moral guidepost, and even um, I go, okay, it would have been really easy for me to say in February of 2020, I retire, I'm out, have a nice life. That would have been the easier wrong. But I made a decision which was around the mission, around the we have to get a vaccine out the door, that 
to make sure I had the compass in the right direction. Once the compass is in the right direction, you follow the right path. And then it's the intuition inside. And there's been a, a million times, especially in cyber, I don't know if this is the right answer, but this is the only thing we have, and we've got to make it, it, and it feels right to go this way. And time will tell whether you're right or wrong, or you have to course correct. And, and that becomes very important. But you have to listen to that inner voice. You have to have your moral compass. You have to have your mission, and you have to have that North Star. And once you put those together, you go, oh, yeah, I get this. So it's there. You can have follow-up all you want. That's right. There's every day there's another business idea. There's another venture, another GoFundMe, another, another crowdfunding project. A lot of them fail. And I'm sure that a lot of them follow that same idea too. They maybe they learn from it, maybe they don't. But they, when they started out, they all know. I at least I hope they all know that it will work. But do they? But then do they really know it will be a good business model, or are some of them in it, especially in the cyber? Because I feel very uh, very strongly about this. I find my, most of the VCs are in it to make money. They know nothing about security. They know nothing about mission. They might know a little bit of something about networking or something about data. But the companies that I find that are highly successful, their CEO has a mission. They understand what they're doing in the, in the frame of cybersecurity and can articulate it, why it's important. They're, they're in it, and even if they have to sell their company, um, because the technology is the right technology, and it may have to go to a, another company to launch it. Um, and it's not just, yeah, there's a lot of failures in the VC market, but I would tell you, there's a lot of dud technologies, and most of them have tried to sell them to me. And, and I've been there, and they're not ready for prime time, they're not ready to launch, and I've even had some uh, entrepreneurs come to me, and it's like, well, really, you know, I, like I ask them about cybersecurity, and they're like, well, well, it's not really, that's irrelevant because you have to do this. I had someone come to my office, right, J&J, &J. Um, uh, about 20% of our business is in China. They told me I could just block all the IP addresses in China. This, we wouldn't talk to our network in China. I said, I don't think that's gonna work. And that is people who are into technology, yeah, you can do that, Probably not a good idea. And that's where do you really understand the security side, the mission side, and the business side of what you're doing. And that's why most of them fail. Some of them are mismanaged. You know, they're, you know, they go on big holidays and do big events and spend all the money instead of putting it into the technology. There's many, many reasons, but it's not, it's not one size fits all. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Well, hey, let's give Marion a final round of applause. Thank you, Ms. Allison. Thank you.